All right. Hi, everyone. Good afternoon. For those I haven't met, my name is Shannon Contalonis. I am the center admin for Ed Policy Works Research Center. I'm just going to be going over a quick, uh, a few quick logistics for today before we get officially started with our guest speaker. So as our screen indicates, um, our presenter today, Dr. Angelia Dukia, says that she is totally open to questions throughout, which is wonderful. Uh, so feel free to ask qualifying and clarifying questions throughout. Uh, the best way might be to utilize the raised hand feature inside of Zoom. And at that point, I can call on you and kind of interject and uh, let her know that we have a question. However, if you're also comfortable just kind of unmuting whenever the question pops up and there's a break in the conversation, feel free to do that as well. Uh, we'll also have about 10 to 15 minutes at the end of today for questions. Uh, so if you feel more comfortable at the end, we can do it that way as well. Finally, hopefully it won't be a problem for us, but if we have any sort of Zoom bombs or people who attended that maybe shouldn't be here and make themselves known, I'll immediately close down the meeting and attempt to send out a uh, quick new link to everyone who is attending. So that shouldn't be a problem. So at this point, I'm gonna hand it over to Dan, who's going to formally introduce our speaker and I'm excited to get started. Thank you. Hello, and welcome to our education policy seminar today. I am Dan Rodriguez Segura, a doctoral student at the School of Education and Human Development. This talk is part of the Education Policy Work Seminar Series sponsored by the Bankard Fund for Political Economy. Each semester, Ed Policy Works hosts a number of talks from external and sometimes internal speakers on a host of education policy and research related topics. This is the final talk for the semester, but you can find our fall lineup on our website in the coming weeks. For information on Ed Policy Works or the next seminar, please visit our website. Today, we are delighted to welcome Dr. Anjali Adukia. Dr. Adukia is an assistant professor at the University of Chicago Harris School uh, of Public Policy and the college. In her work, she is interested in understanding how to reduce inequalities such that children from uh, historically uh, disadvantaged backgrounds have equal opportunities to fully develop their potential. Her research is focused on understanding factors that motivate and shape behavior, preferences, attitudes, and educational decision-making with a particular focus on early life influences. She examines how the provision of basic needs such as safety, health, justice, and representation can increase school participation and improve child outcomes in developing country, uh, context. Dr. Arukia will be talking for approximately one hour and will leave 15 minutes for discussion and questions at the end. Please note that any additional or personalized questions after 1.15 can be addressed via email as other meetings will begin soon, uh, at that time. Thank you for attending the uh, policy uh, seminar today and please join me in welcoming Dr. Adukia. Great, thank you so much uh, for, for having me. It's such an honor to be here with you all today. Um, Dan, thank you for that uh, lovely introduction. Uh, my name is Anjali Adukia, and in my work, I am interested in understanding how to reduce inequalities such that all children have the opportunities to fully realize their potential. You know, my prior work was mostly in India where I had worked in NGOs. And often when people think about, you know, education in developing countries, they often jump to, you know, I know, let's give laptops to, to children. And, you know, look, I think children would love to have laptops, but, you know, they faced, you know, very fundamental concerns related to safety and health and hunger. And so I became really interested in understanding how much further could we get if we just addressed these very, very basic needs. But another fundamental need is this notion of representation, right? So if you don't see yourself represented in the world or others represented in the world, how does that shape your beliefs? And so today I'm very excited to be presenting initial joint work with my um, amazing co-authors, Alex Ebley from Columbia University, Emily Harrison, who is uh, one of our PhD students at uh, the Harris School, and you all should definitely keep an eye out for her on the job market. She is incredible. Um, and uh, our two computational scientist uh, colleagues, Haki Zumwami, Barali Runesha, and Theodora Sass, who are the... Um, you know, the, the brains behind all of the AI uh, that, that we're about to use. Um, I also want to give a very special shout out to Marlisa Dalton, who is one of your amazing UVA law students. She was 
the original RA on this project many years ago. Um, and so it's really exciting to, uh, to have her here and to see you know, what progress has been made based on the foundation that she helped lay for us. Um, and uh, I also wanna give a very happy birthday to Beth Schuler because I know that it was her birthday this week. Um, and I, and before I begin, I also want to acknowledge the land on which I'm living and working. And in Chicago in particular, we recognize the Kickapoo, the Peoria, the Potawatomi, the Miami, and the Sioux. So, you know, the process of education itself and its associated books and curricular materials necessarily and by design transmit not only the values of society, but also whose space it is. And the inclusion and exclusion of different identities send messages which can contribute to how children view their own potential and the potential of others, which can then in turn shape subconscious defaults. And race and gender represent particularly salient identity, identities, but it's important to account not only for multiple identities, but how they interact and intersect with experiences of exclusion and subordination. So there's this notion that representation matters, right? And there have been these calls for increased representation over time, but we don't actually know, has this happened? But in order to understand that, we have to figure out how do we even systematically measure representation in the first place? You know, traditional content analysis, you know, involves people literally going page by page, you know, and, and getting very, very deep knowledge um, from the books, you know, that, uh, that children might be reading where they're coding images and text manually, um, you know, and the benefit is this gives you very, very deep knowledge, right? It, you can measure simple representations in addition to very complex representations. But the disadvantage is that it's extremely expensive and, it, and it, it's necessarily quite slow. And so what we're actually thinking about doing, what, what we propose to do is actually to use computers, you know, especially in recent years, there have been these amazing advances in computer vision and natural language processing techniques, which allow for machine led content analysis. You know, and this allows for estimates over a very large set of corpora, right? There's no difference or very little difference from going from five pages to 5,000 pages. You know, the drawback is that it is harder to measure complexity, right? So this is definitely going to be able to give you a better sense of who is represented, but much harder to think about how people are represented, how they're portrayed. Um, you know, and to be clear, AI itself is only human, right? It necessarily reflects the biases of the human coders who, you know, create the, the, the data sets and train the models. Um, but, you know, this is also a problem with any kind of content analysis. So in this study, we have two primary contributions. The first one is that we actually want to advance machine-led content analysis um, and first developing tools that help convert images into data alongside established text analysis tools. So many more people have actually, you know, taken text analysis tools and, you know, figured out how we can, you know, analyze like large bodies of text. Um, but there isn't as much use, especially in the social sciences, of systematically pulling images from books or from content to analyze, um, you know, changes over time. And um, the second contribution is actually we're going to be applying these tools to measure representation of three primary identities, race, gender, and age, in award-winning books over the last hundred years. And you know, these three identities, so first we're gonna be looking at racial constructs and you know, again, race itself is you know, this ill-defined amorphous construct. And so we're looking at it in, for, in three primary ways. One, measuring skin color, which is through the images measuring putative race. And so this is the, the racial identity that society might place upon someone. Um, so if they are, you know, black or Latinx or Asian or white, um, and this we can actually draw from both the images and the text um, and also one's birthplace. Um, for gender identity, we are gonna be looking at whether someone is female or male or the representation of female or male. And, you know, this is obviously a limitation where, you know, further work really should account for non-binary gender queer and gender fluid identities. And, um, you know, but um, today we are just looking at the binarization of, data, of, of gender. And then we also look at age, whether someone is represented as being younger or a child or older or an adult. And then we're also 
often look at who is doing the representing. And so in these award-winning books, we are actually going to break them up into different collections. And the two main collections are mainstream collections. And so these are awards such as like Newbery and Caldecott awards, um, which are given to books based on high literary value and not for popular appeal. You know, there is no explicit intention to highlight any particular groups. And then there's the set of like diversity awards. Um, so these are like the Coretta Scott King awards, um, which are meant to highlight the African-American experience or the Stonewall awards, which are meant to highlight LGBTQ experience. And they are specifically selected to center, you know, traditionally underrepresented or marginalized identities. Um, and, you know, they're often brought out during, you know, uh, Black History Month or Women's History Month. Um, and so we want to see, like, you know, who is doing the representing, you know, who is actually accounting for intersexual experiences. Um, so just to give you a quick preview of our findings. Um, so, you know, in terms of the first contribution, we find that images are actually a very important data source. And, you know, the, these machine learning tools, you know, enable cost-effective content analysis. Um, and especially when you're thinking about classifying skin color, you know, these pixel-based tools really help to mitigate human bias that might come into play when trying to classify skin color because you might be using, you know, other cues. And again, you know, I want to be very clear that we are not trying to replace traditional content analysis because, but this is a complement to that. Like they actually can, um, they work off each other, um, you know, in very important ways to give a richness to an understanding of like the, the content that is represented. So in terms of the second contribution, we find, you know, great inequality and inclusion in the representation of race, gender, and age. Um, so in these mainstream books, we see that they generally show characters with lighter skin, you know, even after conditioning on race. And so what that means is, so for example, you know, if um, in the mainstream collection, when they depict someone of a given race, such as someone who's Asian, then um, they nest, they, they, they are depicted with lighter skin than characters in of the same race, in the diversity collection um, who are then depicted with darker skin. We also see that children are shown with lighter skin than adults, which, you know, biologically speaking is unclear that that's actually um, representative of actually how uh, society actually um, works. And we also see that females are more likely to be seen than heard, right? And so this suggests that there may be symbolic inclusion in pictures without substantive inclusion in the actual story. And we see that males, especially white males, are more likely to be represented regardless of the data source, whether this is pronouns or gendered words or character names, famous figures, you know, geographic representation or in images. And relative to the US census, we see that, you know, people who are black, people who are Latinx, you know, females uh, are underrepresented um, both in the images and the text. Um, so I'm going to describe to you just quickly the, the data. Um, I'll talk about the methods that we're using. Um, I'll kind of go through some of the findings and I'll summarize and, you know, again, feel free to, to stop me at any point. This is early work um, and there's a much larger research agenda that we, um, that we have planned. So, you know, why is it that we're studying award-winning books? You know, these are very highly influential books. Um, so, you know, the winners of these books often appear in school libraries and classrooms in on people's bookshelves. You know, they are the ones that are trotted out when they're saying, oh, we want to highlight a specific identity. Um, as I said, we're, we're, we're breaking them up into a set of collections. There's the mainstream collection, the diversity collection, um, and then within the diversity collection, we actually break them up into smaller collections. So those that, you know, highlight people of color, you know, people, th those that highlight the African-American experience, those that highlight people of different abilities, females and LGBTQ people. Um, and this is the list of awards that we are drawing from. And so these are awards that have been featured by the American Library Association. Um, so they're either administered by or featured by them. Um, and the mainstream awards are, you know, primarily the, or, or the Caldecott Awards and the Newberry Awards. These are the oldest awards going back to 19, 1922. Um, and you know, again, they are very clear that they're not that they're supposed to be for all children uh, and not, you know, specifically highlighting any identities. The other awards are what we call the diversity awards, and um, you know, each one of these is supposed to be highlighting, you know, specific identities. And so we can look and see whether or not, you know, these books actually highlight certain identities, and also, you know 
how much they take into account intersectionality as well. Um, you know, and, and there is some differences in terms of the timeline. The mainstream awards go back to the 1920s, whereas the diversity awards start in the 1970s. They actually started with the Credit Scott King Awards, where um, up until that point, no author of a Caldecott or a Newberry had ever received, no author of color had received um, either of those awards. And so they started the Credit Scott King Awards specifically to highlight the African-American experience and African-American authors. Um, and then a bunch of other awards followed suit. So to tell you a bit about our image as data pipeline, so how do we convert images into the data that we want? So we start with a digitized scan of each page in each book. And this, you know, um, is actually its own bottleneck in its own, uh, in its own right, right? You have to scan every single page um, and actually get it into some sort of digitized format. Um, we then use face, to, we, we, we train a model to detect faces. And, you know, this was also a challenge because most face detection models out there have actually been trained on photographs. And so we had to train our own model to be able to um, detect illustrations because a vast majority of the images in these books are illustrations. And so then to to um, classify skin color, we first use what's called a fully connected convolutional neural network. And what this does is it identifies the periphery landmarks on a face, right? So, you know, where are the eyebrows, where's the edge of the face, where's the nose and the lips. Um, and then from there, what it does is it creates what's called a convex hull. So it just connects the outer set of those dots and that creates what's called a face mask. But as you see, it's not quite perfect, right? Like there's, there's some like extra pieces on the side and whatnot. And so then you actually apply uh, what's called a continuous conditional random field to refine that face mask. And what that literally does is it goes pixel by pixel by pixel and it says, okay, I'm gonna look at this, this pixel and I'm gonna look at the neighboring pixels around it and say, okay, is this skin or not skin? And then it predicts whether or not that spot is skin. Um, or like a, you know, the facial landmark of interest. And then if it is, then it keeps it. And if it isn't, then it doesn't keep it. Um, and so then from here, this is what we're using to actually detect skin color. But it's not that you can just then say, oh, let me just take, you know, one pixel because there's shadows, there's highlights, you know, and there's a lot of different colors within any given face. And so we then apply something called k-means clustering. And so what that does is depending on the k that you choose, so in this case, we're choosing five, it basically partitions all of the colors in, the, in that, you know, that face that's segmented skin and says, okay, what is the closest color that that particular color, like each of these pixels go into, you know? And so then it gives you that set of K predominant skin colors weighted by prevalence. And so then what we can do is we can actually use those predominant skin colors and take a weighted average. Um, and, you know, then we're given uh, either a continuous measure, which is, you know, called perceptual tint. And that tells you, you know, how dark or light the skin color is, or we can actually just, you know, take a, an agnostic view and say, all right, if we just want to, you know, divvy this up into, you know, what might be darker skin, medium skin, or lighter skin, we can just take tercials. And here, what we've done is we've actually just divided it literally in thirds. Um, you know, and this is not perfect by any by any means, and you know, represents each of these. You know, every single piece of this pipeline represents a space for greater innovation and for, for greater, for further work, um, you know, because these are relatively new tools um, and really haven't been used in the social sciences. And so, you know, you can imagine trying to think about like taking a more data-driven approach to say, okay, you know, like let's have a bunch of human coders actually label this and say, you know, what's the distance to space? Because remember that RGB space is actually, you know, three-dimensional and we're trying to make it into, you know, almost a two-dimensional space. So, you know, but this is just as a, as an initial, uh, initial proxy and in other work, we're actually trying to develop this further. Um, you know, now, Skin segmentation itself is not perfect, right? So most of the time it seems to work really well, but sometimes you can see, you know, it, it only captures part of the face or it only captures some of the hair, you know, or a corner. And then it's gonna actually 
give um, potentially uh, you know, erroneous weighted averages in terms of the actual colors, right? You know, there's also other challenges. So when we think about monochromatic faces, right? How do you necessarily def define like whether something is light, you know, medium or dark? Um, and so, you know, what we do is we just simply like, again, we look at it on that perceptual tint scale um, and see where it falls. Um, and then there's, of course, like in, in children's books, there are a lot of animals, um, there are a lot of illustrations. And so, you know, trying to figure out, well, are we capturing the actual faces? And then is it segmenting the skin properly? You know, in each of these cases, it did detect the face properly. And while it didn't segment exactly the right skin, it seems to be giving us at least something um, relatively, uh, you know, accurate in terms of the actual skin color. Um, you know, then if we want to actually classify other features such as race, age, or gender, then we train another model using AutoML um, through Google Vision, um, which then, you know, predicts the likelihood that a face represents a given identity. So, you know, now it's still going off of that original detected face and, you know, it gives um, a percentage. And what we do is we simply just take the majority prediction and then classify it as that. And again, you know, one could imagine saying, okay, well, instead of saying it's 51% female, therefore it's classified as female, you know, maybe we have some sort of bandwidth or you could actually use the average probabilities um, to, uh, to classify, you know, people of a given race and, or, or age or gender. Um, and, you know, even the age predictions are actually broken up into, you know, infant and child and teenager, uh, adult and senior. And so, you know, you could think about using that greater variation um, along the way. And so, you know, face detection itself and feature classification might incorrectly label a feature or may miss a feature. And so there are these um, performance metrics that actually come that you that that come out of the model. So there's something called precision and there's something called re recall. Precision is, you know, the proportion that are assigned a given label correctly. So the higher the precision, the fewer the false positives. Um, and for recall, the it, that is giving us the proportion not assigned a label that should have been. So the higher the recall, the fewer the false negatives. Um, and, you know, to train our models, the way we get this is we actually split our initial data sets into three parts, the training data sets, so that's 80% of the data, we then take 10% of the data for validation and 10% for testing. Um, and so what these models give us is that for the face detection model, um, it's about 93.4% precision. And what this means is that 6.6% .6 of the faces we detect may not actually be faces. We also see that we have, that we neglect to identify one in about four and a half true faces. And so this is a false negative. Um, for feature classification, so remember this is like, when, when we say features, that means race, gender, and age, um, we get 90.6% precision. And so that's about nine and a half percent of the features that are classified may be actually incorrect. And, you know, we get 88.98% recall, which means that 11% of the features or 11% are not assigned a label, um, but may actually possess the, the given um, label. So, Angeli, can I ask a question? Of course. Hi. Um, so just is, is there any correlation between sort of recall and precision and race or gender or you know, because you, you see sort of like, at least, you know, you have all these horror stories of Google sort of misclassifying black people. And so, it, I know, I guess you trained the own data, but I'm just wondering if, if there's any of those uh, correlations between race, gender, or I guess age. So if, if the concern is about, you know, are there correlations between who is being detected as human or non-human, or if, if those faces that are detected as being non-human are then erroneously given, you know, a racial classification. So that's something that we are um, working on right now to try to understand further. So in any, in all of our manual coding, we actually haven't seen that. Um, but again, we did train our own models. And so, you know, um, so at least initially we haven't seen that, but we do want to look at that 
carefully to make sure that there isn't something, you know, erroneous going on with this. And so actually it's interesting. Originally, we didn't want to use the race classifications specifically because we were very concerned and we thought, okay, skin color, you know, itself is a racial construct or at least, you know, it's used as a, as, um, you know, kind of a, a human categorization. Um, but we did have the race classifications. And so we thought, well, let's look at it and see, you know, how these models you know, do differently. And especially thinking about mainstream versus diversity, how is it that they are representing race, you know, either similarly or differently. Um, but no, that's a very, very important point. Um, you know, as I mentioned earlier, and this is, you know, case in point, every single component of this pipeline represents an opportunity for further innovation and work. So anyone who's interested in AI and applying it to these tool or applying it to, you know, there's a whole range of questions that one can apply these to, uh, you know, if you're interested in the method side, there's a world of possibilities. Um, and, you know, there's a lot of computer scientists who are really eager to, to work in social sciences. And so, you know, I know for us that this partnership with the computer scientists has just been so amazing and generative. And, um, you know, I certainly feel very fortunate. It's like, I feel like singing that Sound of Music song, like, you know, I must have done something good to be able to work with such an amazing team. Um, and, uh, um, yeah, it's, it's been um, really exciting to actually just see how the different people uh, perceive or kind of work with, um, work with data and work with approach questions. So in terms of the text as data pipeline, in terms of converting text into data, we are really drawing upon established tools here. You know, so this is where you take digitized scan of every page, of each page in each book. Then you actually apply optical character recognition. And what that does is it can, it uh, detect, detects all of the words and then spits it out into a file, um, you know, so it converts it into ASCII. And so that way the computer can actually read each of the words. Um, and here we're using Google Vision OCR, but there are a number of different um, OCR techniques. Google Vision OCR just has been found to actually give the greatest accuracy, um, which is why we were using it, but there's a free version called Tesseract. Um, it's also an Abbey Fine Reader um, and, and some other tools out there. Then we actually clean the text where we remove any numbers and you know, front and end matters such as copyright information and tables of contents. Um, and this is again, something that we do algorithmically. So that is not something that we're doing by hand, but we did have you know, a set of manual coders go through such that the model could be trained um, accordingly. And you know, part of it is that for this, we don't actually need numbers for anything, um, but you could imagine like if you were doing some sort of you know, curriculum analysis or something that you might actually want to keep uh, the numbers in them. So first what we do is we actually use a software called Named Entity Recognition by Spacey. And what this does is it gives name information from unstructured text. And there are two different kinds of names. So first what we do is we actually wanna identify the famous figures, right? So you think about Rosa Parks or George Washington. Um, and so we actually draw from the Pantheon 2.0 data set, um, which is a data set which basically went through and um, uh, through scraped Wikipedia files and it determined for every single name, what is the gender and the birthplace. It actually also has occupation data. Um, and so what we do is we take all of the named, the named entities, you know, and so this could also be New York, it could be, you know, rupees like currency. And so, you know, all named entities, it matches it to Wikipedia data. And then if it has a match among the famous, these famous figures, then it is classified in our data as famous characters. And then what it does is it can characterize the gender and the birthplace for every single famous character. But then there's a bunch of other names, right? So you think about first names, such as Isaac or Beth. Uh, and, you know, oh, so first actually, then what we do is we take those, that list of, of famous characters and we actually manually code the race. Um, but so then what we do is we take these first names that, that, that occur and we match them to social security data. And, you know, based on social security data, that actually helps us predict the gender of a given name. And so, you know, if something is, if Cameron is 9% 9 um, 9 of the people in the SSA data are um, labeled as female, then, you know, 91% are labeled as male or identify as male. And so then that name would be um, given a male designation. And so that's how we, you know, turn character names into information about gender, birthplace, and race. But then there's also what, what's called token counts. And so a token is just a continuous string of 
like characters. So in our case, it's a word um, that are could be gendered words or words related to ethnicity um, or age. And so, you know, then we actually we just generated a long list of words. So you think about pronouns. So gendered words are things like you know, she or queen or butler um, or boy. Um, ethnicity words are things like Mexican, Kenyan, Canadian. Uh, color words are, you know, black, white, but also blue, red, you know, so you could imagine saying, okay, well, let me, this is like, these are rudimentary ways that one might actually just use text to say, okay, what is the representation that's there? And then we, you know, among the gendered words, there's a set of age words. So if someone's like, daughter or girl, then that's like a younger word. Whereas if it's, you know, queen or dad or mother, then those are older words. And so what that finally gives us is a set of measures, you know, from for images and for text um, that give us, you know, uh, measures of race, gender, and age. And so just to give you a sense of the skin color data and what it looks like in raw form. So each of these dots represents, you know, the book level, a book level average skin color. And, you know, again, remember we're looking at it in 2D space, but actually a way that you would want to look at it is in 3D space. So if you were to look at it, you know, if you were to turn it, then you would actually see a lot of these dots are piled up on top of each other. And I should also note that with skin color, there are three kinds of like skin color types that we are identifying. So there's, you know, in color theory, human skin colors are when R, which is red, is greater than G, which is green, which is greater than B, which is blue. So if R is greater than G is greater than B, then we classify that as a human skin color. Um, you know, and if a, so then if you look at like this, so what the Y axis is, and so actually I should just explain, you know, the first row shows the, the um, the scatter plots for the mainstream collection. The second row is for the diversity collection. The third is for the collection highlighting people of color. The fourth is for the collection highlighting African Americans. The next one is those highlighting people of different abilities. Then the next is for females, and the next is for LGBTQ individuals. And you know you can see that they do enter the sample at different times. Um, the y-axis, the way that you can look at this is that you know the the higher you go, then the higher the standard deviation, um, and the higher the standard deviation, the more vibrant a color is. Um, and uh, you know here what we say is to to label whether something is monochromatic. Um, we say if, if it has a standard deviation of 13 or less, then we classify that as monochromatic. So that could be black and white or sepia. Um, and, you know, then, but of course, in, in children's books, there is the green robot or the blue alien. And so we also want to capture these kinds of like non-typical colors. Um, and so we can look at them, you know, over time. Most of the specifications I'm going to show you are really focused on these human skin colors, um, but we do it for, you know, monochromatic and non-typical. You could also imagine looking at them together and the patterns actually remain the same regardless. Um, and so, you know, uh, everything is color coded. And so anytime you see pink, that generally um, applies to the mainstream collection. Anytime you see blue, that um, goes to, that applies to the diversity collection. And the way to interpret these skin color figures is that, you know, the further left you go, the darker the skin color, and the further right you go, the lighter the skin color. And so what you see here is that, you know, the mainstream book books are generally distributed towards depicting lighter skin colors relative to diversity books, which are um, more often showing darker skin colors. If you want to look at it in terms of tersiles, so again, this is just agnostically breaking up that perceptual tint into thirds, then you see that, you know, the mainstream collection, you know, is predominantly, you know, in this medium bin, um, with you know a bit more of the lighter skin relative to the mainstream. Now, to be clear, right, this is again like you know, it's unclear that this is the right uh, division because a lot of the um, faces that get put into this median skin 
um, are actually quite light uh, as well. And so, you know, and similarly, there there is um, there are uh, characters or face colors in the in on this side of the, the medium skin mid skin tercile, which are actually darker skin colors. Um, whereas you see in the diversity that there's you know more distribution uh, among darker skin colors relative to medium skin colors. You know, and this this pattern holds. You know, when you look at the collections that highlight people of color, um, but interestingly, it also holds uh, when you look at the collections that highlight females as well. And um, when you look at that over time, you know, you see that there is this kind of bunching in the middle um, for medium skin colors um, with this uptick in, in lighter skin, um, terse, the, the lighter skin tercile over the last three decades. Um, whereas for the diversity collection, it seems like it's consistently showing, you know, darker skin and medium skin colors, or at least in the, the darker skin uh, and medium skin terciles relative to the lighter skin terciles. You know, and this is the you know, same pattern that you see when you look at it for monochromatic um, faces and for you know, non-typical skin colors. Um, so the same pattern um, shows up. So what's also very interesting though, is that, you know, as I said, for every face, we are not only classifying skin color, but we're also classifying race um, or we're predicting race, you know, based on this model. And so what this is showing you is, you know, this is saying within a given race classification, you know, what is the distribution of skin color that is being shown? So here, right, so again, remember, if you go left, um, that's showing darker skin colors. If you go right, that's showing lighter skin colors, you know, and the pink is showing the mainstream and the blue is showing the diversity collection. Um, and you see that for every single race, um, mainstream is depicting a given race as being lighter than people of the same race um, in the diversity collection. Uh, and this is you know, the case, again, whether you look at it, this is for polychromatic human skin colors, even if you look at it um, in terms of monochromatic skin colors. Um, so this, this pattern seems to hold. Um, we also see that you know, people who are white are predominantly um, represented in images regardless of the collection. You know, and when you wanna look a little bit deeper in this and you say, okay, well, who else is, is represented in these images? We see that actually female presenting faces are substantially present over time. Um, you know, which also one might say is, oh, that's, you know, there's, there is that, again, there is this inclusion of female faces. It's again, not um, above 50%. It's still, you know, on average less than 50%, but still, um, you know, more than one might expect, especially going back in time. But when you look at who these people are, you see that it's actually that the vast majority that are pictured are actually white women and white men um, for every single collection again. Um, and actually within collections, you know, you see um, some, some differentiation, but, um, but you know, the, the predominant um, characters who are, who are pictured are, um, are, are white women and men. When you look I'm at it in terms I'm of- I'm gonna jump in real quick. Of course. That's okay. You have a question from Brian Kim. Brian, go ahead and ask your question. Hi, I am really jazzed about this work and I'm really excited by how you've been explaining everything crystal clear so far. I'm taking a lot of notes. Um, I, had a, I had a question just as we were starting to get into results. Um, in the pipeline that you've described, there's just like a lot of prediction happening. And, and as you discussed importantly, like there are a lot of prediction, places for prediction error to then come up. Yes. Um, so assume like, you know, take, take aside Isaac's point for a second. That, that there may be some systematic error happening in, in important ways, but like holding that aside, even if we don't think that that's the case, that at each step prediction happen, is happening, um, prediction error can kind of be thought of as like measurement error, right? So I'm curious to hear your thoughts on like, given that there are many stages of prediction and thus many stages for measurement error to kind of come into these estimates, how should we be thinking about error bars around some of these, these figures? Oh, very exciting. And yes, this is something that we uh, talk about frequently. Um, and so I'm going to show you something which like, so we're, we welcome any ideas that you may have. But one thing we were thinking is that we could, you know, take seriously these like the measurement of precision and recall and actually try to calculate confidence intervals using like, you know, if you use precision that can help you potentially get a lower bound, you know, it's possible that you can actually take recall and get an upper bound. Now, of course, this is just if you took the feature classification, um, precision and recall, it doesn't then also account for 
what about the face detection, you know, um, precision and recall. And so it is something which we are trying to um, figure out. Another thing that we're actually in the middle of doing is, um, oh, whoops, that was not where I had to go, um, is uh, we're having a set of people, you know, go through a validity exercise, like actually, you know, a set of manual coders, like, you know, crop the face, predict for each face, what is, you know, the, um, you know, race, gender, and age, and also, you know, classifying the skin color. And, um, you know, this is obviously, there's, there, what we've already seen. So we have done this for a subset. So we have it for about 260 um, faces. And there is a lot of disagreement among our manual coders. And so that in itself, right, you think about the iterator reliability, you know, that gives us a theoretical maximum as to what, how valid, you know, these, like, we can even, or, you know, how reliable are our manual codes, you know, and so like, then we, what we want to do is actually then look at the correlation with the actual predictions themselves. And, you know, what we're hoping is that that can help us also think about like error bars as well, but it's, it's such an important point and um, something that we've been trying to think a lot about. And so we welcome, if you have thoughts or ideas, like totally welcome them for sure. So thanks. Thank you. Uh, Dan, I see that you're, go ahead. Yeah. Um, yeah, I'm just curious for, so I see that you have the Latino classification, like but you know that that includes a lot of race, you know, a lot of races and a lot of skin colors. So I'm I'm wondering how you're dealing with that. Yeah. So okay. So yes. Yeah, so there's. So here, this is the image prediction. And actually, to be clear, the way that the 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 data that was used to train this model came from a data set called UTK Face. And the way that they classified race based on all of these images is they had. Um, Asian Indian, so we actually combined them into one Asian category. They had, um, I think it was like, uh, I forget how they had um, divvied up the, the category for black people. Um, they had an other category which included um, Latinx and Middle Eastern people. And so that's why it's Latinx and others. And then there's people who are white. And so this is different. This is distinct from skin color in the sense that it's likely that in the prediction they're drawing from skin color but they're also based on basing it on features of the face itself so you know on eyes and nose and mouth and like you know other like predictions based off of the training data itself and so certainly there's going to be you know a lot of error now what's interesting is that regardless right like even if there's a ton of error um it's still predicting a majority as being people who are white and then like you know, people of color, there's just a very small proportion that are being predicted as a given race, which is why we actually then, you know, I, I actually really think this is very informative in and of itself, as you mentioned that like, you know, people um, of each of these, you know, racial categories are, you know, have a range of skin colors. And so it's really interesting to see that, you know, for a given race, what is the skin color distribution that is being represented? And so, you know, this actually allows us to kind of try to disentangle that a little bit, um, but it's absolutely the case. Now for this, this is, so this was based off of the pictures, um, the images themselves. This here is actually the race and gender classification of famous figures. So again, think about Rosa Parks or George Washington, or, you know, name your, 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 your famous person. Um, and what you see here, right, is that even then, right, we have just a very, very small proportion of people who are not white, um, who are represented as famous figures. And in fact, you know, among every single one of these categories, generally within a racial category, males are generally represented more than females in terms of famous figures. And so if you wanna even just look at like top 10 appearances by collection, what we see is in the mainstream collection, the top 10 appearances of famous people are all white males. And in the diversity collection, they're all males, except for Rosa Parks, who's the one, who's the one female. In the mainstream collection, you know, if you wanna get to a male of color, then you, it's just number 11, where you actually have a black male, Martin Luther King Jr. Um, but then to actually make it down to, to find a female, you know, the first female is at number 24, um, who's Eleanor Roosevelt, who's, you know, a white female. And if you wanna get to a female of color, then you have to go all the way to number 45 um, to get Rosa Parks, who's a black female. And so, you know, there is, um, 
you know, it, it's, it is amazing that like so much at the top is still very much centered. Like, so if you think about just like how much work, you know, a white male is doing relative to, you know, anyone else that like, you know, each of these people are doing a lot more work, you know, relative in terms of like representation. And so there's just not as much, um, yeah, representation generally. And when you look at this, these are the race of these unique famous people in the text and you map it against the US census. Now, you know, I, I, again, wanna be very clear. We are not saying anything about what optimal representation looks like, right? Like, is it equal? Should it be, you know, 50-50 for gender? Should it be like, you know, based off of the sent the US, the share of the population in the US, but what about people in other parts of the world? And should it be based on society or should it be, you know, overweighting populations that haven't necessarily been um, represented in the past? And so, you know, this is not to say anything about what we think is, is optimal. It's just simply to kind of give a sense of, okay, you know, this orange bar um, is the, you know, share of a given population, uh, of, you know, a, a share of a given race in the U.S. population over time, you know, and what you see is that the, you know, that, you know, Black people have been consistently underrepresented relative to their, you know, the, the share of the census, you know, whereas people who are white have been consistently overrepresented, at least in the mainstream collections, you know, and same thing in, in Latinx that you see that, you know, relative to the growing population, um, the representation of famous people has not actually kept up with that at all. Um, another way to kind of think about, you know, race and or at least human categorization broadly is where people are born, right? And so again, like, you think about like, if you are not exposed to, um, if you're a child sitting in wherever in the US and you you only hear about famous people from, you know, certain areas of the world, then it can actually also limit your worldview. Um, and so in the mainstream, again, so the Newberries and Caldecotts, you see that there's predominantly representation in the US and in Europe. Whereas in the diversity collection, there's much greater, you know, geographic representation around the world. When you look deeper into this and again to say who are these people who are represented, you see that it's predominantly males when you have greater geographic representation, you're more likely to see males represented from, you know, places outside of the US or Europe, you know, relative to females. Um, another way that you can look at this, as I mentioned before, are very rudimentary counts of words. And so, you know, you do see in terms of words related to ethnicity that those collections that highlight people of color are more likely to include ethnicity words um, or words related to colors such as black or white. Um, but, you know, we don't actually see any differences in terms of like blue or red. Um, and so, you know, thinking about the distribution. Oh, I see. I see a, a hand raise. Todd, did you want to say something? Yes, I, I had a quick question. Also, just thank you. This presentation is super interesting and fascinating, and everything's super clear um, and it's very aesthetically pleasing as well. <laughs> well, that's um, Emily Harrison. Go, Emily Harrison. So <laughs> nice. Um, I was curious. So earlier you had mentioned um, interrater reliability and interrater agreement, and I was curious whether you had looked at whether inter-rater agreement had also changed across time. And I'm wondering in part whether um, potentially having more racially ambiguous uh, characters, is, it could be a potential strategy of some of the illustrators or, or authors in this case. So I'm just curious whether that is something that you considered. Yeah, so I think, so in terms of thinking about inter-rater reliability over time, that, you know, we have, we're not able to look at just because we're not, we don't have people who have given us ratings like over, over time. These, this is like people oh. that we are bringing on. However, but sorry. on the, um, uh, on the piece about like, oh, sorry, what was it? So, remind me the second part. Sorry. Um, oh, I, was, I should clarify. I was thinking interator reliability in terms of um, the time of the books the time of the publication of the books. So yeah, and so each of, so the thing is, is the um, regardless, of whenever you see something in terms of over time, necessarily, like because these are award-winning books, they were published in that year. So if you see this blip, right, this dot right here represents, 
you know, mm -hmm. the, the 1930s, you know, and this represents the 1940s, any books that are published in the 1940s. And so this does show how it's changed over time based, you know, contemporaneously at that given time. Um, but it is interesting, this notion of like, you know, racial ambiguation or, you know, especially thinking about skin color uh, and, uh, you know, is it that like, there's this notion of the melting pot and it's like, oh, we're all, you know, we're colorblind and we can see, you know, everyone looks the same as opposed to really the tossed salad, you know, like, are we, are we going to, um, you know, really embrace people at like, you know, different, you know, ends of the spectrum. And again, remembering that that middle tercile, um, you know, in some ways masks true heterogeneity within the colors themselves. And so, um, yeah. So, here, what I'm showing you is, uh, and by the way, if I, when I'm responding, if I don't, if I'm not clear about something, feel free to stop me and say, oh, wait, can you explain that further? Um, so what I'm showing you here, now this is going simply on the text analysis side of things. So this is showing you the distribution of all female words across collection. And when I say all female words, I mean pronouns, other gendered words, such as, you know, again, queen or boy, um, or, you know, character names, such as like, you know, the gender of a given or of a, of a given famous figure or the predicted gender of a first name. Um, and so that is combining all of them into this, right, to say female words as a present of all gendered words. So what you see here, 0% implies that there's 0% female words, um, and 100% is 100%. So, you know, we see that the mainstream collection is more skewed towards having male words relative to the diversity collection. What's interesting is you wanna say, okay, well, how does it do in a collection that is intended to highlight females? And you, know, you see that the female collection is more skewed towards having female words. But what's also very interesting is that it is less female skewed than the mainstream is male skewed. So the mainstream is actually representing more males, you know, average um, relative to the females. And you can look at this in many different ways. And so even if you just look at like, you know, the share of female words, you know, over time. And here again, remember that the orange represents this, the U.S. population share of, in this case, females. Um, you see that every single collection is under that 50% mark um, over time. At, you know, except for the female collection, which on average is greater than 50%. You know, you can look at this on, on average and you see that, you know, indeed that's the case. You can look at it in terms of, you know, the ratio of male words to female words and it's, you know, always above that 45 degree line. Um, and, you know, one might argue, well, you know, pronouns, like when I was growing up, he was the gender neutral term. So of course that's going to look, you know, skewed male. But when you break it down by those four different kinds of word, gendered words, you know, sure, for, for pronouns, like, you know, then you say, okay, yeah, they're still, they're less than 50% on average for most of the, for all the collections, except for the female collection. But then that shouldn't explain why, you know, someone might choose, you know, a, char a character name that would be identified as being a male name. Um, and you see the same pattern for every single one of these, um, where the female collection is predominantly female, um, but the, the other collections are, um, you know, less than 50% on average. Um, but except the one place where that isn't the case is when you look at the share of unique female famous figures. And so this is, so before what I was showing you is the mentions of, of famous figures. This is like, okay, let's say, you know, you have, um, you know, Eleanor Roosevelt show up three times in a book. She only gets a value of one for a given book. And she's a unique, like how many times she's uniquely mentioned. And so even in the female collection, you don't even get to a third unique female famous figures. It's 69% male um, famous figures that are actually represented. Um, you know, we then plot like, okay, the female faces that are detected as a percent of all faces, by the female words as a percent of all gendered words. So this is like looking at image versus text. And you see that, yeah, I mean, you know, it is less than 50% on average, but there is this, we see that females are more likely to be represented in images um, than text than in text over time, which is consistent with the maxim that women should be seen but not heard. And, you know, this really suggests that there may be symbolic inclusion in pictures without substantive inclusion in the actual story itself. Um, 
And finally, what we're going to talk about is just looking at age. And remember, these are books that are targeted towards children. And yet, whether we look in images or we look in text, we see that, you know, the, so the darker color here represents a, the adults and images. Um, the bottom row here represents, you know, adults or older, um, you know, words in text. And you see that adults are predominantly represented despite these being, you know, supposedly child-centered. Um, and, you know, I think actually probably the most surprising and I think pernicious result of all of them is when you look at you know, age by skin color. Um, so this is breaking it up by gender, um, females versus males. But I think that the thing to take away from this is, again, remember the left side is that it's representing darker skin colors and the right side is representing lighter skin colors. This like grayish blue represents adults and this purple represents children. In every single collection, children are depicted as being lighter than adults. And, you know, it's conjecture as to why this, what, what this, what message this might be sending or why this might be going on. But biologically speaking, actually, you know, there's research that shows that melanin is, you know, that the skin is actually more likely to get lighter over time because of the breakdown of certain biological processes. Um, you know, there are some conditions where it might, you know, go the other way, but then you'd expect a net effect. And so, you know, but what you may not expect given the literature is that this is the direction that things would go regardless. And so, you know, can you say, well, is this, what is this portraying? Is this portraying innocence? Is this portraying, you know, something, you know, jelly grows are trying to, um, you know, uh, put a spotlight on particular people, but, you know, you then connect it to even in society, how, you know, young black children are often treated as being older than they actually are. And, you know, then you say, well, again, if that is how kids are being represented, then, you know, if kids are being represented with lighter skin, um, then what does that necessarily do for children who have darker skin? So, you know, just in terms of cost effectiveness, what we did is we hand coded a set of 30 short stories from a third grade reading textbook, which was published in 1987. Um, and, you know, just to code this book, a very, very conservative measure, it took about 33 to 40 hours to code the entire book, which is about 400 pages. So that's like an average of five to six minutes per page. It actually took longer than that. But, you know, we want to be as conservative as possible. If we wanted to hand code the 164,000 pages in our sample, you know, we've taken anywhere from 13 to 16,000 hours, um, which, you know, at an hourly wage of 15 to $20, um, then it would have cost anywhere from 200 to $330,000. And so, you know, again, like whether we want to run through our pipeline, you know, five pages versus, you know, 100,000 pages, you know, there's not that much of a difference uh, in terms of the time. And, you know, we actually see that the measures are, are really quite similar. You know, we're, as I said, we're, we're doing more coding to be able to say, um, you know, with more, uh, to be a little bit more definitive, um, you know, but we see that male, uh, males are more represented than females in, in both the manual and the AI predictions. You know, when you look at hand-coded measures of skin color, um, you see that there is more, this is originally we were thinking about using like the emoji scale, like the Fitzpatrick scale. Um, so then breaking it up into sixths, um, which we could easily do as well. Um, and we just thought that, you know, in some ways breaking it up into darker, medium and lighter is a little bit more intuitive for people. And actually these emoji scales are skewed more light skin as well. Um, whereas they actually, you know, really pile in darker skin colors, you know, in just a few relative to, um, you know, over three types. Um, and so, you know, to, to sum up, um, because I know that uh, um, just to leave time for questions here at the end, you know, we do see that images are this really important data source and to be able to, you know, do widespread data collection um, to get information systematically from images, you know, these machine learning tools can really help enable a very cost-effective content analysis. Um, you know, and, you know, going back to the question, um, you know, I think it was related to Todd's question about like, skin color and kind of, you know, reliability, one thing that we actually really noticed is that, you know, again, these AI tools reflect human biases, but so does manual coding. And it mattered so much. So, you know, students who come, 
you know, from outside of the US, like what is considered light skin or medium skin in like India is very different than what might be considered light skin or medium skin in the US, you know, on average. And so, you know, the, using these pixel based tools helps to mitigate, you know, that potential human bias, at least when classifying skin color. Um, and then, you know, in terms of our second contribution, we see that there is, you know, inequality in how different characters of different identities are represented. Um, you know, the mainstream books tend to depict characters with lighter skin, you know, even after conditioning on race. We see that children are shown with lighter skin than adults. Um, you know, females uh, seem to be represented more in images than in text over time, which suggests that there might be this symbolic inclusion in pictures, you know, without substantive inclusion in the actual story. You know, we see that males, especially white males, are more likely to be represented regardless of the data source, whether it's, you know, in images or geographic representation or the different kinds of words, such as gendered words, pronouns, or character names. You know, and then we see relative to the US census, um, you know, people who are black and Latinx um, are underrepresented in images and text. And so um, I'm gonna stop there just to allow for, for questions. And um, yeah, thank you so much. This was, uh, it was a real pleasure to, to share this very early work with you. So um, yeah, we're, we're, and this is, this is part of a larger research agenda that we, um, that we plan, but uh, yeah, we welcome any thoughts and ideas. This was wonderful. Thank you so very much for um, presenting all these findings. Uh, so obviously individuals feel free to either use the raised hand feature or if you know, you're okay with just unmuting and jumping in, I'm sure lots of you have questions. I know a pretty easy one that I can start us off with really quick was um, in any of your all's research, did you find any authors or illustrators who um, republished a book later that would then change some of these findings based on like the art that they used a second time around? Yes, so we did, we do see that qualitatively, like we noticed it as we're kind of going through a lot of these books where we said, oh, look, like now they're representing people in, you know, a different way. And so what we're doing is we are, I mean, part of it was about like which books we could acquire. Um, and so we haven't systematically been able to kind of look at like for every single book, if there were like new editions, but it's something which actually would be very interesting to see, like who updates their artwork and how do they update their artwork? And, you know, and actually it's, it's not, it doesn't go one direction, at least qualitatively speaking. In some cases, you know, just take skin color, for example, in some cases, you know, we see the, the Coretta Scott King Award winner um, actually depicting characters in actually a much more asset-based framework, right? Like in showing them like, so showing characters with um, a little bit more empowered or actually with darker skin. Um, whereas in some of the mainstream, we actually see lighter skin colors being represented. So maybe it's still showing someone who, you know, is black or Latinx or Asian, but suddenly they're actually being shown with lighter skin. And so again, that's qualitative. It is not systematically um, any kind of finding, but I think it is something that'd be interesting to look at for sure. And again, I just want to like give a shout out to Marlisa Dalton, who is on this call. She is amazing. And you all are very lucky to have her at UVA, um, even though she's about to graduate. Anjali, I, I have a quick question. Have you, have you tried counting your results by the same characteristics, but by the author? So we are in the Wait. midst. We actually have just, uh, we're close to having all of the authors and illustrators classified based on you know, gender and race. And so it's something that we do want to do for sure. Because it would be interesting to see, you know, especially you think about the literature of you know, teacher student identity match and how important is that? Or you know, is it that certain authors or illustrators depict people in a different way? And you know, again, like what we're showing here is simply like, let's just get into the black box of like what children are encountering. What are children being exposed to? Just let's just measure the representation as to like who is being represented. But you know, necessarily, like if you're only looking at who, you know, it, it, it accounts to a numerical accounting, which in and of itself can actually lead to tokenism, right? So we also, in, in like, you know, parallel work, what we're trying to do is actually develop tools and draw from tools that help us understand how characters are represented. Um, and, you know, that is, uh, it is a trickier problem, uh, but a very important problem. And so if we can do that systematically, then, you know, we think that would actually be a really nice contribution. 
Anjali, this is really cool, cool work. Thanks so much for, for coming and, and sharing it with us. Um, Happy birthday. <laughs> thank you very much. <laughs> um, I, I was curious about, you know, like it strikes me that you, you all have coded kind of a, almost like a sort of population of potential books that are like out there, you know, I'm convinced that they're like out there in libraries and bookstores and, you know, in people's homes, but, but so how do we sort of think about like going or in future work, how are you all thinking about kind of going from like what's potentially out there for kids to read and like what kids actually read and how that kind of differs by kids and their identity, um, you know, because you could imagine educators and parents like thinking about this differently for different kinds of kids, right? Yes. So also one thing that we're doing is um, that I didn't have quite ready to show you today um, is we're actually mapping this on like library checkout data um, to actually see like what kids are actually checking out. And so um, we only have it for one particular location, but if people have ideas or know of data sources that like show it broadly, it would actually be really nice to see relative to local population share, you know, who is checking out what and where. What does seem at least like from preliminary um, analysis, it seems like that, you know, the mainstream books, the Newberry and Caldecott's get much greater readership after like, you know, in terms of like, you know, they get more exposure relative to those in the diversity collection, um, but there does seem to be a bump. But again, that's preliminary and I, you know, we, uh, we, we're, we're just kicking the tires on it to make sure. <laughs> Um, I have another question. This is like, while we're in the world of just like thinking about hypotheses of what relationships might exist in the data, I know that something that's been happening in the movie industry a lot recently is the discussion of like who gets to be black, like do, which which black characters actually get to stay literally visibly in skin color, like still just their actual skin tone rather than getting painted like a green alien or a blue alien or becoming a robot or something similar. <laughs> And I guess I'm curious, um, since you have the data of kind of like the names of characters with the non-traditional skin tones of just like, you know, the green, the blue, I'm also thinking back to my childhood of like, if anyone watched Doug, like Skeeter was green for some reason. So I'm curious to hear if there's, if there's any sort of like predictive um, characteristics going on there. Yeah, so actually one thing, a lot of the, like the work that tries to connect names to race is pretty flawed, right? Because it's like, how do you, you know, disentangle a name of someone who is black versus white, right? There's a lot of overlap. It may be a little bit easier to say, oh, this is a, you know, typically Asian name or Latinx name, you know, but even then it's pretty fraught. Um, and so, you know, that's one of the reasons we specifically don't do that, though that is something that people do in the, the literature where they try to say, okay, let's take these last names or whatever. Um, and so, it would be nice to be able to look at that systematically. We haven't figured out how to do so, but this is absolutely something that we um, would like to do. And actually, you know, you mentioned in terms of movies, you can imagine saying, okay, like, you know, bringing in a different set of tools in terms of um, the actual audio, right? And so like what accents are given to different characters and how are different people represented? And so, um, you know, I think, I think it represents a really important, uh, you know, area for research and innovation for sure. Todd, go for it. This is, um, this is related to, I think it's really fascinating to actually connect this with the library checkout data. Um, I wonder if even just like connecting it to what books are in stock at various libraries, um, that might be publicly accessible. And if you could kind of web scrape that, that would be fascinating to look at too. Yeah, so actually, I mean, again, for the one place that we, um, that we have data for, that's, that's part of what we would like to look, look at it for sure. Um, that's interesting, like, would this be something that we could web scrape from other places? You know, I guess it's, it's probably like, certainly we could look at maybe the major library systems which are online and see if there's a way to, to web scrape them. Though I think the major libraries are more likely to have the representation. I think more interestingly would be to look at, you know, smaller systems as well, but still like, um, you know, in the major library systems, are they likely to have, you know, the Newberry winner at every single branch as opposed to, or have multiple copies as opposed to maybe the one copy of, you know, that Stonewall that, that received an award. So yeah, that would be, that would be actually really nice to look at. 
uh, I noticed that someone mentioned uh, about school-based book fairs and yeah, we would actually love to partner with, you know, a publisher and, um, you know, get that kind of like book procurement data and look at it by location. And, you know, again, what, what is the representation that's being shown and kind of, you could say, okay, number of students have received or have bought XYZ book and, you know, what is the, like, you can kind of a measure of exposure, but, you know, again, like, so we're looking at library, you know, we have this library checkout data, we would like to also get book, you know, procurement data, but actually in some ways you think about who's the selection who go into each of these, like, it's probably different kids on average who are checking out from a library relative to purchasing books. I know when I was a kid, we never bought books, like everything was from the library itself. And, um, you know, whereas there's some people who are like, yeah, I'm just in a book, boom, I buy it. And so, you know, in some ways it would be nice to have both as compliments, um, but they're still informative in and of themselves. And actually just thinking about the pipeline itself. So, you know, again, this is, we're, we're talking about this from an academic perspective, but actually this is not just an academic exercise and it would be so great. Like if even at the publisher level, like they have everything digitized, like just the, how do you take a scan and differentiate image from text and detecting the face and all of these things. And like, even just turning the OCR into proper legible ASCII code, you know, encoding of, of text, you know, you wouldn't have to do that if you had the raw data from the publishers themselves and they have all of it digitized. And so it just shifts the entire pipeline over and actually probably increases the, the um, you know, the measurements that like in terms of like it decreases a lot of the measurement error and um, is gonna give you something a little bit more systematic. And you could even imagine like, you know, it's not that one book is gonna do everything nor can it, right? Again, that would be probably the definition of tokenism, you know, whatever that means. Um, but, you know, educators and you know, parents and, you know, librarians, they are social architects of the experience that they're trying to um, give children, right? And so if, they could have the information about, okay, this book has this kind of representation and this book has this kind of representation and this book, and then they could think about broadly, okay, what is the, the set of materials that I want to have available for children? Um, that could be really powerful actually. And so, uh, you know, um, just from a policy and practical perspective, you know, being able to turn, like make these tools available and something that we want to do, you know, is to, you know, have a suite of software tools, like easily, like you just kind of, I don't know if it's push button, but you know, you put, put in and then you actually like can spit out these figures and, um, you know, at least on a set of measures with the, with the knowledge that it's not perfect. And, you know, certainly like manual content analysis is very important and there is a rich, rich literature uh, on, on this. And so, um, you know, it is nice to look at them in, in concert with each other. Thanks for that. Walter, go right ahead. Yeah, I think somewhat related to manual content analysis. I'm wondering if this is something that, or if this is a tool maybe that would be useful. I'm thinking about, you know, moving up in, in age, perhaps, of, of children for, for history textbooks. Yes. Um, and I'm wondering if you see this as an application there, or if it's the case that with history textbooks, it's, it's like, okay, there's not like that many publishers out here. So maybe we don't need um, an automated system like this one, or, or perhaps that is something you've thought about. I don't, I don't know, but wanted to get to see if that's something you had considered. Yeah. And actually um, the way we started, or one of the ways that we started was actually looking at textbooks and in, uh, in particular. And so we, you know, undertook this long, like we're going to digitize all of these textbooks, but then COVID happened. And so we weren't, you know, able to, to go as far. And it's, that is, a, you know, an, an arduous process you go through in your library loan, you try to, you know, get the exact textbook and is it the right one based on the ISBN number? But, you know, I think actually it would be really nice to know, like, who are the you know, who are the famous figures who are being put on? Who is being talked about early in a book versus later in a book, you know? And how are characters being represented and doing what? And who's given accessories? Like you could imagine like taking this further and saying, who's given glasses? Who is, you know, looking off to the side with a big smile and who's actively writing on the board or, you know, kicking a soccer ball or whatever. And so, you know, I think there's a, again, this is all about how people are, are being depicted, but you know, these are very influential books. Textbooks are, you know, Millions of children are exposed to textbooks and it's kind of like sanctioned, truly sanctioned material. I mean, this is considered to be sanctioned material as well, these award winners, but 
at a much more fundamental level are these textbooks as well. So no, I, that, that we would love that, love, love, love that. And so if people have ideas of where to get digitized textbooks, <laughs> that would be great. But otherwise we're just doing that by hand <laughs> in terms of the scanning. That sounds very labor intensive. <laughs> <laughs> Isaac's exactly. got some some raw data for you uh, that he's showing <laughs> in his screen. <laughs> Excellent Good question. Um, I'm currently working on a project where we're coding extra textual data um, that parents have around a particular book that um, relates to a diversity of kids from around the world. And I wonder if a potential future project or something that you're interested in would be, well, how do people actually t talk about the books and what kind of dialogue do those books um, lead to? Because it's one thing to read the text, but then a lot of the socialization happens be beyond just the text. So how are y'all thinking about that, if that's something you're thinking about? Yeah, so you know, going back to the textbook point, actually something that we were also wanting to digitize is not just the student edition, but the teacher edition, which gives like the lesson plans and whatnot and see like, you know, even like for a given set of figures or for a set of identities, how much, you know, how much more is talked or how much more guidance is given or not given or how much more space is given. Um, but no, I think that that's actually really, really, really important because it's the caregivers, it's the adults who are helping to shape that experience. And so, you know, like you can imagine having a bunch of books which are very homogenous, but if you have a caregiver who is able to help um, children think through, you know, think through it and be critical thinkers, like then, you know, that could actually be more powerful in and of itself. But you could also have 100% females represented. But if, you know, if it's all, uh, you know, she wakes up at 5am and she gets her husband breakfast and gets her children awake and then she makes them lunch. And again, there's nothing wrong with that. But if that's the only way that someone is represented, then again, it's going to be skewed to saying, oh, we have a, you know, 100% this, but, it, it, you know, 100% female, but actually how like the, the potential of like what role you know, someone can perform in society could be very limited. I mean, there's this book, May Lee, it's a Caldecott book from early on. And, you know, actually it's very female centered. Um, the, the main character is female, but, it, you know, and she's looking for a kingdom, kingdom. And it turns out that like the way that they end the book is that, you know, her kingdom is, and she's, it's a picture of her sweeping the floor is in the home, in a tidy, clean home where she's looking pretty. And, all, you know, it's again, all of those things that you're like, whoa, okay, this is not the message that, I mean, it's, it's not likely to be the message that the only message that you want, um, both females and males and anyone to take away as to like, what are the roles of, of women? And that this is like the world that you might be, um, you know, wanting to set them up for. Well, I feel that, you know, as the, the convener here, I should uh, remind us all that we're actually at time, but I think, um, you know, we had no problem with, uh, with awkward Google uh, Zoom pauses today, which I think is an indicator of just the level of interest and excitement around this work. It's really creative and important. Um, so thanks so much again for coming Thank today. You Join for me in. Having us. Yeah, it was a real honor and pleasure. And, you know, I'm sad I can't see meet you all in person, but one day. <laughs> yeah, some, someday soon. Someday soon. Okay, thanks so much again, Anjali, and um, have a great rest of your day, everybody. Thank you all. So, Shannon, now what do I do? Yeah. <laughs> now you're welcome to just hop off this. You have about 12 minutes or so to be a human if you need to go do anything. And then uh, your next calendar invite with that Zoom should be on there. And I just saved the chat and I'll work on downloading this video and I'll get you everything afterwards. You're the best. Thank you so much. This was great. That's, uh, I mean, that was fascinating. Super engaged. That was... Thank you. No, and thanks for your questions as well. Really appreciate oh, it. I mean, well, I Talk kindergarten, we'll talk forever about myself, but I talked kindergarten for about five years and looked into like potentially writing children's this books and so like, this right now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, actually, so it's been really that. fun to talk to school librarians and early childhood educators through this because like a lot of this is stuff that like they didn't need AI tools to tell them any of this, you know. Yeah. <laughs> um, Zero of it. But people often say, look, my hands are tied because this is what's available. This is what I'm given. And I don't, and again, I don't think it's like people really do genuinely want. 
Oh, they really do. They do. It's like but you you work with what you're given, and mm-hmm. you know, in some ways, like these books will only reflect what's in society. And you know, if if you don't have some other tool to intervene. Well, and we're a, you know, a society of convenience for the pros and cons of that bring. And so the easier books are that to get and buy and the ones that are just, that come up to the top of Google searches or Amazon and all that good stuff. And unfortunately some things suffer at those hands. So this is wonderful. And uh, I'm sure, you know, you've heard the term many times that 